your faithfulness and for um, Jesus Christ and his uh, death, his sacrifice, his blood that he shed for us and uh, for the fact that uh, we now um, can be washed, we have um, standing with you, we are clean, we have the righteousness now of Christ applied as our sins have been forgiven as your children and um, we're thankful for this wonderful truth. And um, we pray that you would help today as we've gathered together to worship you. We pray that you would um, help us to give our best um, in each aspect of our worship, and the things that we've offered, um, we've come to offer to you today. Help as we um, hear the teaching and the preaching of your word. Help us to um, be ready and attentive um, to hear, to um, not just be hearers, but doers of the word, and that you would help those who are teaching as well, just give them wisdom and um, as they present your word. And uh, we pray for your people. We pray that you would meet the needs, um, just um, as uh, there are those who are away as well traveling. We pray that you would meet needs, um, perhaps those who are not feeling well as well, that you would just provide for them. And um, just other situations, we pray for our church, we pray for our people, help us um, to be growing in our sanctification, in our obedience, in our purity, in our love, in our unity, and um, all these things today, we want you to be glorified in Jesus' name, um, amen. Let's go ahead and pray and we will get started. Father, we're thankful for the privilege of being able to be in your house this day. We pray for your blessing on our class, the other classes that are going on. Help us that these truths would, we'd be equipped to share them with others uh, as we finish, get towards the end of Bible study four here. We pray that you would help us to have doors of utterance, to walk through those doors so we could uh, do these studies with people. I pray that the truths would as well affect our own lives in a great way. Thank you for the glorious things that are involved in you saving us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we were talking about sanctification 
Sanctification. Can somebody give me a definition of what sanctification is? What does it mean? <coughs> what does it mean to be sanctified? Yes. What is it? Okay, there, there's a progressive aspect of sanctification, which is an important. We typically think of that progressive aspect. Progressive sanctification is being transformed more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. As we see him in the word of God, we are made like him as we behold his glory. And then when we're finally in his presence, we're perfectly like him when we see him as he is. So yes, progressive sanctification is that transformation into the image of Christ. So yes, that is, is a very blessed fact. Is there an element of sanctification that happens at the moment of the new birth? There is. What would we call that? Does anybody remember? It says with the letter P. Well, I guess the practical. Positional sanctification. So at the moment we're born again, we're set apart in our position. <clears throat> we're taken out of the realm of sin and death, and we're set apart to Christ. Now we are set apart to him. And so that's positional sanctification. We're set apart uh, to him. And sanctify is related to a term that starts with H. That is an important truth. What is, what is the word sanctify connected to? Holy. Yeah. Sanctify, holy, hallowed. Those are all same group of words, sanctified and holy. So we're positionally set apart at the moment we're born again. We're progressively being transformed in the image of Christ. And then you could see the ultimate sanctification is when we're perfectly like Christ in glory. So we saw those three aspects last time. Do you remember um, an example of how sanctify one of the most common Old Testament words for it means set apart in a very basic way where there were some people that were set apart in a way that's kind of shockingly evil, but the word sanctified ones or holy ones was used. Does anybody remember what that was? These people that were engaged in tremendous wickedness, but in the Hebrew, they're actually called holy ones because they're set apart to someone other than God. Yes. What is it? The sodomites. Isn't that amazing? One of the terms for sodomite, we looked at it actually in a bunch of texts. These were people who were set apart to false gods, to demons, and they were actually in Hebrew called holy ones because they're set apart to their false gods to practice all kinds of abominations. So when you're set apart to Satan and to false gods, you do things like your father, the devil. When you're set apart to the holy God, you do things like the holy God. See? So there's this set apart idea to holiness. And then there's that. And there's other words that emphasize the moral transformation aspect. There's, um, so not every word for holy simply means set apart. There is also that moral transformation aspect. And in that sense, Sodomites were certainly not holy ones. Okay? But they were set apart okay, to something very evil. So that's sanctification. Positional and then progressive, and then ultimate sanctification. Let's read uh, Hebrews 13, 12, and then we're actually going to go on and look at some views of sanctification. But, you know, we should actually read the Bible, because we're sanctified through the truth of the word, right? So the Bible will be a good place. That's, that'll be helpful for us, right? Hebrews 13, 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So Christ suffered for us, that he might sanctify his people with his blood. And I think that, you know, would encompass the positional, progressive, and ultimate aspects. It's a package deal. Uh, it's when you get positional, you can't have positional sanctification without that showing up in your life. It'll show up in your life. Just like if, you know, a tree is alive, it's going to grow. If a boy or a girl is alive, he or she is going to grow. When you have, uh, when you're spiritually made alive, it's going to show up. Some people become stronger and grow faster and stronger than others, but there will always be some evidence of the new birth. Now, just as a, we're going forward here with sanctification, but can anybody remember what was the main Catholic error, one of the main Catholic, they have, they have, there's so many errors that you can, you can name lots of them, but what was one of the main Catholic problems with their doctrine of justification? What did they do 
with justification that was a problem. That's right. They combined justification with sanctification. That's right. So they, the Roman Catholicism combines justification and sanctification. Now, when you get justification at the moment of faith, God will also begin to sanctify you. But you're not justified by your sanctification. You're justified based on Christ's righteousness alone. And if you say that your righteousness is part of how you are justified, you're saying that Jesus' righteousness is insufficient. And we need to add a few filthy rags. Let's, let's take this pure white robe of Christ's righteousness, add some filthy rags to it, and improve a little bit. Well, that's a big problem. That's a big problem. And that's why, since they think that you need to be justified by your sanctification, why they think that God is angry with them. Well, he is angry with them because they aren't justified. And so that's why, you know, they don't think they can go directly to God, or it's scary to go directly to God. So you need St. Matilda to help you, or St. Lucifer to help you. Right? And so you pray to St. Matilda, and Matilda can help you, or St. Lucifer can help you. Um, and I showed, there actually, I showed you the idol. You can actually find there is, it was a St. Lucifer. Yeah. So anyway, okay. So that was sanctification. We went through that. <coughs> and I wanted to point out a few different views of sanctification. Now, with a, you know, a seeking sinner, you're probably not going to go through these different views of sanctification, but you should be aware that they are, because depending on his or her background, this person may have heard these things and, you know, he watches, you know, the TV, the Christian station or whatever. He's going to have all kinds of, who knows what he's going to hear on there, okay? So there are, there are some charts here that give you some different views of sanctification so that you kind of are aware of some, some erroneous views out there. And uh, so um, the cross in the chart represents the point of the Christian's faith and new birth, Okay. The dotted arrows in the first three charts depict that the state resulting from the crisis may be repeatedly lost and recovered. So you can see, maybe it's hard to see from that distance, but see between the crisis and the second work of grace, there's a dotted line that can go up and down. That means you can flip-flop back and forth. So you can go from the one to the bottom, go up and down, go up and down. Okay? So the Wesleyans, the Wesleyan view of sanctification. So this is the view of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism and those who followed him. Now, Wesley believed salvation could be lost as well. So he was an Arminian, not from the land of Arminia, but somebody who believed in the theology of Jacobus Arminius. And so he believed salvation could be lost, okay? And he also believed in baptismal regeneration. So an infant, when an infant was sprinkled in the Anglican church, because Methodism came out of Anglicanism, that infant was born again by being sprinkled. Okay, And so according to Wesley, though, when the baby was sprinkled, well, let's say that sprinkled baby grows up and lives an immoral life. Okay, Now, if that means, that means that that baby lost salvation at some point after being born again, and so needed to be born again, again. So you needed to be regenerated a second time. So you could read a sermon. Wesley preached a sermon called, You Must Be Born Again, and most of what he says in there is great, because he's speaking to a bunch of people that are living like heathen, but he thought that they were regenerated when they were infants, when they were sprinkled, but they just lost it. And so they needed to be born again, again. And if you don't, and you know, God is a merciful God. Maybe some people hearing that sermon could actually hear enough truth to get saved. We would hope so, but a definitely a big problem. Okay, so now if that person is born again, again, after being sprinkled as an infant, then he loses it and he gets it. And when he's, when he's two years old, he's mean to his mama. He loses his salvation. And so now he's unsaved again. And he needs to be born again again. So now after he's born again again, okay, when he's, you know, 17 or something, here's Wesley preach and he becomes a faithful person or whatever. Now, that is the first work of grace, according to Wesley. This first work of grace did not necessarily mean he would live a holy life, although there could be some ineffective progress. And if you think about it, if you're in an Anglican you know, Methodism originally was kind of taking Anglicanism a bit more seriously. When an Anglican state church, it's going to be full of unsaved people, right? So they're all Christians, but many of them seem to have no progress in spiritual life. So they are hopefully born again, right, according to this theology, but they're not really growing. They're just saved, but no, no growth. Now, at a later point, according to Wesley, you could have a spiritual crisis and become perfect, through entire sanctification. So, for example, when 
Uh, the Bible tells us to be perfect, like Matthew 5.40, be therefore perfect as your father which is in heaven is perfect, or Noah is called a perfect man, upright in his generations. So Wesley would conclude from texts like that, that you can experience a second work of grace, and then at this crisis of the second work of grace, now you become entirely sanctified. So you are now completely sanctified in all who you are. Now, Biblically, what that would really mean is you would become perfect and as holy as God in your nature, your thoughts, and your acts. That was what it would biblically mean. But it was very obvious that that didn't happen. And so all these people who have this second blessing theology, second work of grace theology, have to lower the level of what happens in the second work of grace. Because obviously the Methodists who said that they'd experienced entire sanctification weren't as holy as Jesus. <laughs> they weren't as holy as the Father. They weren't as holy as the angels. So instead, what supposedly happened is they had perfect love. So they had, now they have perfect love, and so they're entirely sanctified, and um, so somehow they are perfectly loving, but they still are less than sinlessly perfect. Okay? <clears throat> so that's Wesley's thought. And then if you, you can fall out of the second work of grace back to being an ineffectual, only having a first work of grace. So you can flip-flop back and forth between Christian perfection, which is less than actual perfection, supposedly, and just being a normal Christian. So you flip-flop back and forth, and that can happen over and over again. And you can even flip-flop from the lower plane of, of, um, uh, of just being a mere Christian, and you can sit enough to lose salvation again. So you can, like, go, it's like, like that game the, with the ladders, the, the uh, snakes and ladders, and you can go up the ladder, and if you fall back, and you fall back far enough, you lose salvation. If you fall back only part of the way, then you're just, you know, halfway back in the game, okay? So that's Wesley's view of sanctification. Methodists who still believe in Methodism would take this view. Now, most Methodists don't believe in Methodism. Most Methodists are just, you know, completely apostate, don't believe anything anymore, okay? They worship, you know, a goddess or something. I mean, you could have all kinds of total apostasy, just ridiculous stuff. But Methodists that actually believe Methodism, which are a minority, just like Catholics that believe in Catholicism are a minority. Most Catholics don't believe in Catholicism. I mean, even if the Pope believes in Catholicism anymore. But, but the Methodists that believe in Methodism would take Wesley's view. Also, this is a, if they, a, a church calls itself Wesleyan holiness, it might take this view. Or the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army takes something very similar to this view. Okay, so if you're if you go to a Salvation Army religious organization, they're going to teach you that you need to get the second work of grace, and that's when you really, you know, achieve uh, uh, perfection. Okay, um, I remember I think it was a Salvation Army guy, this uh, past uh, church in uh, Wisconsin. He was knocking on doors, and he got to the, like a Salvation Army minister or something, and the guy said, you know, I haven't sinned in 38 years, or he said some, some I don't remember the exact word, something like that. And the guy said, well, you, you better ask your wife about that. <laughs> and he started to get mad. He's like, oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> well, I guess that was the end of the 38 years right there, right? So, but anyway, so that, that's the Wesleyan view of, of sanctification. And it's, it's not biblical. The Bible doesn't teach you you have a second work of grace. You're unchanged, basically. Then you flip-flop back and forth in the second work of grace. God's grace certainly changed. We should have a second work and a third work and a fourth work and a fifth work and a 274th work of grace. We need a new work of grace in us every day, okay? But there's not this flip-flop back and forth thing. And um, uh, Henry Ironside, he wrote a book uh, that talking about this, influenced by this. He got out of this, this false theology. And the people that said that they'd achieved the second work of grace, what the one problem with it is if you think you're living above sin, you have to minimize sin, and actually it, it, they weren't any more holy than the people who just thought they were just normal people. Uh, and it, it just caused, well, anytime you violate scripture causes problems. Surprise? Right, no, no surprise. Okay, so that's the Wesleyan view. Then we have the Keswick view of sanctification. This is pronounced, K-E-S-W-I-C-K -E is called Keswick, not Keswick, okay? Keswick, okay? So the Keswick view of sanctification. So this Keswick theology developed from the ideas of two Quakers, like Quaker Oats. You know, they have the guy with the big hat. So the Quakers were uh, people who had the Bible, okay, but they also had this inner light, supposedly, that was equal to Scripture. And in a certain way was superior to Scripture because the inner light is God speaking directly to them. The Bible was speaking to people a long time ago. So a Robert and a Hannah Whittle Smith and Robert Pierce Smith were two Quakers, and they developed Keswick theology in the late 1800s. Both of them were unconverted. They taught many, many heretical things. 
And Keswick theology came into Baptist circles through the writings of a heretical Baptist named F.B. Meyer. Okay? F.B. Meyer is the one who brought Keswick theology from uh, the Hannah Whittle Smith, Robert Pearsall Smith, into uh, Baptist circles. Uh, Meyer believed lots of really weird things. If you want to read more about him, uh, there's on my website, you can read. Different from Oscar Meyer. He made the hot dog. This is the guy that brought the Keswick theology, and they're different. Okay? All right. So, um, Keswick theology was a key factor in the rise of Pentecostalism. And in fact, we're going to see that this view of sanctification is very similar to the Pentecostal view. Now, what is the Keswick theology of sanctification? Well, at the point of the new birth, uh, you, when you're born again, the cross there represents the new birth. Uh, you can actually, you're saved now, but you're completely unchanged by God for an indefinitely long period of time. So you're just, you're going to heaven, but God doesn't start to make you live a holy life yet. And you just live a defeated, not spiritual life. You're a carnal man. So now you are carnal, okay? This is who you are, and you, there's no change in your life. And then at a later point, uh, at a second work of grace point, now you actually, you find the truth of Keswick theology. And when you discover the truth of Keswick theology, now Jesus lives the Christian life for you. So you don't live the Christian life by the strength of God's grace. Instead, Jesus is living the life for you. So Jesus now lives your Christian life, um, but, and, and now you're on the higher plane. So at this point of consecration or surrender, you let go, and you let God now live the Christian life for you. So you stop depending on yourself, and certainly you shouldn't depend on yourself. Don't, don't, if you're trying to live the Christian life by depending on yourself, don't. It's not a good idea. <laughs> Trust Jesus and his strength, okay? But you finally discover the truth of Keswick theology, and now you... Uh, live the spirit-filled, victorious Christian life in a world above sin. So you're above sin in, in uh, the sense now you don't commit known sins, according to Keswick theology. So now uh, you, you, you can still commit unknown sins, but you live above known sin, and you're in this higher plane of the victorious Christian life, and you're a spiritual man. And you can flip-flop back and forth between being a spiritual man and a carnal man as you uh, cease to let go and let God and um, go back. Okay, so you flip-flop back and forth. So that's the Keswick view of sanctification. And this, is, this view is influential in Baptist theology as well. Okay, and so um, you can flip-flop between the state where there's no growth to the, the, you know, the victorious life over sin. Now, Keswick theology, has never, there's never been a carefully reasoned scholarly presentation of its position. So what I just explained is the view of many Keswick advocates, okay? But because Keswick theology is unscriptural, it actually is contradictory and it's self-defeating. So you can find Keswick statements that agree with what I said, Keswick statements that disagree with what I said, because it, it's confusing. It's not what scripture teaches, so it's contradictory and it's confusing. So Keswick spreads through testimonies people give, through biographies, through testimonials, things like that. It's kind of like, you know, the snake oil worked for me, so here, try it for you. And, and, you know, the Keswick theology worked for me. I read this book about how this guy got the power, the special secret. So you read, the, you read about the special secret, and then this, you'll have it too. So it spreads through stuff like that rather than careful exegesis of, say, what Romans says on sanctification. All right? And so there, it, it's contradictory, self-contradictory. But anyway, so that's the Keswick theology of sanctification, and that is, uh, you'll find that in independent Baptist churches, unfortunately, some independent Baptist churches. Not here, which is good. Okay, so um, then we have the Pentecostal. This is the Assemblies of God view of sanctification. Okay, so uh, there's other types of Pentecostals, but this is the Assemblies of God. So the Assemblies of God, Pentecostal view, is you're born again, okay, and you live a defeated Christian life, and then there's a crisis. So the crisis is spirit baptism. So you experience spirit baptism at the point of crisis, okay, and then you enter into the victorious Christian life through the second work of grace. So very similar to the Keswick view, because actually Keswick contributed to the rise of Pentecostalism. What's the difference? With the assemblies of God, you have to speak in gibberish when you get the second work of grace. So with Keswick, the Keswick people were, were almost all, all to almost all thought all the gifts were for today. So you could speak in tongues, you could do prophecies and miracles, and the Wesleyans too thought the gifts were for today. Okay, they weren't the cessation of the sign gifts, these people weren't teaching that. Okay? So uh, if you were Hannah Whittle Smith, if someone says, you know, I spoke in tongues, that would be fine, okay? But you didn't have to speak in tongues to enter into the higher life, okay? According to the Assemblies of God, everyone who enters into the spirit of baptism in the higher life speaks in tongues 
at the moment that happens. So if you want to have the better, the second work of grace, you have to go gangala bangala, bugala bagala, bingala ba, shanga ba la ba, and then that's actually now you will be able to live a holy life. Okay? So that's the Pentecostal view. And you can also flip flop back and forth. Uh, between being in the higher life and the lower life. And Pentecostals also, again, you can lose salvation, so you can also fall out and, and be, an, uh, be unsaved again and have to be born again again. Okay? So that's the Pentecostal view. Assemblies of God. Then we have the, what I call the weak unrepentance view of sanctification. Okay? So here, you're born again uh, when you, by faith, Okay? But you don't accept Jesus as Lord yet. Just you receive Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord. And so you're not spirit-filled. You're defeated. You're a carnal man. You've accepted Christ as your Savior, but not as your Lord. And then there's a point of dedication. And then you become a spiritual man at the point of dedication. You accept Christ as Lord. And then there's progressive growth. See that, that arrow that's kind of going up and down? So there's progressive growth. Not that you never struggle, but there can be, there's growth over time. And this growth only begins at the moment after you're born again when you accept Jesus as Lord. Okay? So let's say you're in a one, two, three, pray after me, four, five, six, hope it sticks Baptist church. Okay? So you have, you know, a thousand people that say the sinner's prayer, and 998 of them show no evidence of salvation at all. Well, they're all saved, because I mean they said the prayer, so obviously they're saved. But then those two people who actually, you know, show that they um, are living a godly life, well, those two have accepted Jesus as Lord as well as Savior, okay? And so those people are able to grow while everyone else is going to heaven while they're, you know, fornicating and, 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 and killing people and, and being wicked and whatever. They're still going to heaven. They just haven't accepted Jesus as Lord yet, okay? So that's the, what we call the weak on repentance view on sanctification. One example of this view is the pamphlet Four Spiritual Laws by Crew. Crew used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ, but crusades kind of, you know, crusades, I think, you know, it's like imperialism and all this stuff. So we don't want crusades. So they changed it from campus crusade to crew. Crew. Okay, C-R-U. And so at the end of their, they have a booklet called the Four Spiritual Laws. At the end of the Four Spiritual Laws booklet, they tell you to ask Jesus into your heart to be saved. Okay? Uh, to, to receive Jesus into your life. And if you, were, if, you, if you say the sinner's prayer, you're saved. But now you are living a self-directed life. So that first, let me see if we can get that first, the self-directed life. So here you can see you, the self is on the throne. See, self is on the throne. Christ is outside your life. So you're just saved, but you're still running your own life. Okay? By the way, with the, with the Keswick view, when Jesus lives the Christian life for you, how could you stop? If Jesus is living the Christian life, then you sin. Did Jesus stop living the Christian life for you? It, it doesn't make any sense. It's also not scriptural. So anyway, but so you have the self-directed Christian life, and now you're saved, but you aren't changed by God yet. And then later, when you submit to God, when you surrender to Christ, now you have a Christ-directed life. So now Christ is on the throne, and see the S is off the throne on the side there? And so now you have a Christ-directed life. And here again, this is helpful because, you know, the large majority of people who, you know, are one to Christ through a campus crusade for Christ ministry show no evidence of, of genuine conversion. There's no fruit in their life. They're just as wicked as everyone else. And so those people are saved. They're just living a self-directed life. Okay? And then the few people that actually show evidence of change, those are the people who have the Christ-directed life. They've received Jesus as Lord as well as as Savior. Okay? So that's, the, that's uh, you could call it the weak on repentance view. So uh, after you ask Jesus into your heart uh, to save you, and most of the time there's no change yet because you just haven't received Christ as Lord yet, just as Savior, okay? And then at some point later, you may or may not receive Christ as Lord, and then you start to live a Christ-directed life. Now, when a person is truly saved, he received Christ himself. Is Christ both Lord and Savior? Yeah, you can't have one half of Jesus and not the other half. You get, it's a package deal. When you get Jesus, you get the one who's Lord and Savior, okay? What, which is a great blessing. What a blessing he doesn't leave us in our sin. So now believers, certainly, we should surrender to Christ's lordship every day. I mean, every day we should be surrendering to Christ in a greater way. We're all for surrendering to Christ in a greater way. But there isn't a biblical division where you first accept Christ, but you continue to reject him as Lord, and then later you finally accept Jesus as Lord. The Bible doesn't actually teach that. That's a satanic lie. 
And also the lost don't need to ask Jesus into their heart and say the sinner's prayer to be saved. They need to repent and believe the gospel, whether or not they repeat a prayer. So this view of sanctification, where you first receive Christ as Savior and then later receive him as Lord and begin to grow, this is widespread in many Baptist churches. It, it, it's bad. It hurts people spiritually. Then we have the biblical view of sanctification. Biblical view. So this is the right view, because it's what the Bible teaches. So here, uh, the moment that you're born again, you are spiritual. Like in 1 Corinthians 2, spiritual people are people who have the Holy Spirit. So when you're born again, you are spiritual. You have the Holy Spirit. You receive Christ as both Savior and Lord. You get Jesus, he's both. Now, you may at times, there, that doesn't mean there's no elements of carnality in a person's life. A saved person can act carnally at times. In fact, really, there's areas of carnality in all our life that the Holy Spirit is working by the power of God and the grace of God to transform, make us holy. We all have elements of carnality, even though we're predominantly spiritual, because Jesus has saved us. Okay? So, uh, that, so you can see that Christian life, they can go up and down, but by the grace of God, there's spiritual progress. God is transforming us. He's making us holy. We're not only channels through which God's power flows, though God does empower us and strengthen us, but God actually changes us. He makes us holy by his grace and for his glory. Now, the biblical view of saint, and then we grow through, you know, exercising ourselves. We do certainly trust in the Lord and his grace. We can't grow by ourselves. It's not self-dependence. It's trusting in the Lord. But as we trust in the Lord, we also actively put sin to death. We actively strive against sin, resist unto blood. We study God's word. We meditate on God's word. We, we flee temptation. We, we, we trust in Christ. So there's active spiritual discipline, not just letting go and letting God. Now, the biblical view of sanctification is that you start, you start to grow the moment you're born again. And again, this doesn't mean you can't have times of spiritual decline. You certainly can. But the overall direction of life is upward by the strength of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's energizing us, strengthening us to put sin to death, uh, both specific acts of sin to death and the indwelling sin that's in us, the principle of sin that is still in us, the Holy Spirit strengthening us to put that to death. Now, um, there, there's, we could talk about sanctification you know, much, much longer than that. I don't think you need to explain these views of sanctification to a lost person at this point in evangelistic Bible study, but if he's been influenced by the broad, mushy world of Christendom, uh, you know, YouTube, religious TV, he very, very likely could have heard one of these false views that are out there. And having the true view in your head and having the ability to explain what sanctification is can both help you help a sinner who's seeking, especially if he has a background in evangelicalism. Let's say this person, you know, has said to us, oh, yes, I accepted Jesus as my Savior when I was five years old, and I've just been completely unchanged by God, and now, I'm, now I'm 45, and, and, and finally, you know, doing this Bible study, now I want to accept Jesus as my Lord, even though I was saved when I was five and accepted him as Savior. Well, you know, you can help somebody to see, well, you know, are you sure that you really, did you really, uh, you know, receive Jesus himself when you were, when you were five years old? So anyway, so uh, hopefully that can help you, these different views. Now, look at 1 John 4.16. Each person of the Trinity shapes our sanctification. Does anybody have any question on those different views? Different views of sanctification. Question? Yeah. Question? No? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Four. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Pentecost view, raising your hand. It, you, know, you can raise your hand and does, I don't, I'm not going to think you're Pentecost. Now, if you start going shagalabagala, shagalabagala, then I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay. Now, anyway. All right. Now, that's an advantage of learning the, the Greek alphabet. Alpha, gamma, ellipsis, zeta, theta, capital, moon, xiom, the computer. It sounds like, you know, you, you got it down to say the alphabet, and, and there you go. All right. First John 4, and it, it works just as well, I mean, as <laughs> so whatever they're doing. All right. First John 4, 16. And we know and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So each person in the Trinity shapes our sanctification. So here, um, when it says we believe that God is, is love, it's actually, if you look at the context, it's talking about the Father in particular. Now, certainly the Son loves us, the Spirit, the Bible talks about the love of the Spirit. So each person in the Trinity has infinitely great love for us. But here uh, we see the Father's love is the source of our salvation. 
and um, and you can see that in the context here. So the Father is is loves us. He transforms us because he loves us by his grace. We're conformed to the image of Christ, you know, the God Man, Christ as as the the perfect man. We're conformed to his image. We pursue Christ likeness in obedience to the Father's will. Christ is not only our perfect example of holiness but the source of our holiness. Christ is in us, the hope of glory. So Jesus is in us, and he's transforming us. He's the indwelling source of our holiness. So the Father's love is the creed our sanctification. The Father is, is working in us by Christ. And then the Holy Spirit, Scripture is the mind of the Spirit. So the Spirit is the one who gave us the Scripture. We trust in the Spirit to implant in us and to increase in us a sensitivity and conviction of sin. So we trust the Holy. We trust on on the, the Holy Spirit's grace to, to to strengthen us to fight sin, to convict us of sin, to increase holiness in us, to increase our hunger for God, for the Holy God, and for transforming us into the image of Christ. Just like the Holy Spirit will raise our bodies in the resurrection at the rapture, if if we die before the rapture, uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who actually strengthens us and gives us spiritual life, and so. Uh, it's from the Father, based on the grace of the Son, through the applying work of the Holy Spirit, we're sanctified uh, through the work of the Trinity. Hebrews 12, 10 says we, we become partakers of his holiness. So we actually can participate in the holiness of God himself uh, by the, the work of the Father through the Son by the Spirit. What a blessing that is. Hallelujah. So that's sanctification. Uh, any comments, thoughts about that? What a privilege, right? God will sanctify us. All right, let's go on to glorification and get glorification back up here on the Bible study. All right, glorification. Look at Hebrews 2 and verse 10. Hebrews 2, 10. In this verse, it became him means it was fitting to him. It was befitting him. It was appropriate. Hebrews 2.10. For it became him, Christ, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons, uh, well, well, there's the Father, actually, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So here uh, we can see that Christ is the captain of our salvation, and what is he bringing his many adopted, what is the father bringing his many adopted sons to? Glory. Yeah, that's right. So God is bringing us to glory. So we're not only currently set apart or sanctified as God's own and growing in holiness, but we'll be forever separated from sin and made perfectly holy. We're going to become perfectly holy. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 43. 1 Corinthians 15, 43. So we're going to enjoy eternal glory, dwelling in the presence of the glorious God. So God is infinitely glorious, and we're going to uh, participate in some of that glory. So when God raises our bodies, it says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 43, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. So we're going to be raised in glory. Just like Christ, when he rose from the dead, had a glorious body, we're going to be raised in glory. God's purpose isn't for us only for our souls. It is for our bodies. God is going to give us glorified bodies. And what a blessing that is. The Lord Jesus, in Revelation 1, 10 through 20, remember how Christ, he was appearing to the Apostle John, he had eyes like a flame of fire, his face like the sun shining, his strength, this amazing vision of Christ in Revelation 1. Well, so Christ rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. He has a glorified spiritual body. A spiritual body isn't a non-physical body. It's a body that's fit for spiritual realities, for the spiritual realm. Uh, so he has a real human body that's a spiritual body. Yes? Yeah, I think, I think there is that contrast. So it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. So, um, you know, when a person dies, death is the last enemy. You know, the body corrupts. It's sad. 
Um, it was in the Old Testament, you know, touching the dead body was an unclean thing. This is it's a result of sin. If there were no sin, there would be no death. Now that, obviously, when a Christian dies, there, there's, there's, we don't mourn as those that have no hope. We have no, you know, the person's w- with Jesus. This is good. But still, death is an enemy. Death is the last enemy, which, which is a result of sin. The body breaking down, you know, getting weaker and, and pains and aches and things like that, that's a result of sin. It's a result of the sin-cursed world that we're in. So there's elements of dishonor to that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that, there is that contrast. Yes, does that answer your question? It is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. And if it's the opposite of dishonor, one element of glory would be honor. That's an element of glory is honor. Uh, what is it? It's being like, like well, we're going to see. So that's a good point. What does it mean to be glory? What is, what is this glory? Um, well, look at Philippians 3, 20 and 21. This is part of it. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Being raised in God's glory. Hear the word conversation, like in the King James, conversation meant conduct in 1611. Not just your speech, wouldn't exclude your speech, but your whole manner of life. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So here, one element of this is we're going to have a glorified body, like Christ, free from sin, able to do amazing things. Like Christ, Christ in his glorified body was able to just appear to the apostles. I remember years ago, uh, Heather and I, we hiked the Grand Canyon, and it was really a beautiful, amazing thing. I thought, you know, this would be easier in a glorified body, though. <laughs> it would be easier than, than, than the one we've got now. A lot of up and down here. So, glorified body. Now, we're going to have that. That's an element. And look at 1 John 3 and verse 2. <clears throat> 1 John 3, 2. And, of course, it's not just the glorified body. It's also holiness and purity inwardly. You could say glorified body, glorified soul, glorified spirit, glorified you. <laughs> you are glorified. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. We are currently adopted by God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. So there's some element of this we can't fully, it's so, it's so good we can't even comprehend it, which is a good problem. You have something that's coming that's so good you can't understand it, that's good. That's really good. But we know that when we, he shall appear, or, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So when Christ appears, we will be like him. And what could be better than that? Being like the glorified Son of God. So we're going to see the glorified and our resurrected and glorified Lord Jesus Christ and like him. And being like him is central to the coming heavenly glory. Will there be a wonderful new Jerusalem? Yes. Will there be a thousand year reign before that? Yes. Will the streets of gold and all that be wonderful? Yes. But Seeing the resurrected and glorified Lord Jesus Christ, that's central to this. Um, So in heaven, Christ appears as the head of glorified humanity. So he is the immediate means by which God reveals his mind to his creatures. So God will, even now, God reveals himself to us through Christ, and that will continue. Uh, we'll, We'll see God in seeing Jesus Christ. Jesus is the object of divine glory. And the sight of him, seeing Jesus, will be transforming for those who have loved him on earth with an undying love. So uh, on earth we hope for heaven, but we don't hope for heaven apart from a visible sight of Christ. We want to see Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. That's what we want. Uh, There was a man named Richard Sibbies who lived in the 1600s, and he said this, quote, Heaven is not heaven without Christ. It is better to be in any place with Christ than to be in heaven itself without him. All delicacies without Christ are but as a funeral banquet. Where the master of the feast is away, there is nothing but solemnness. 
What is all without Christ? I say the joys of heaven are not the joys of heaven without Christ. He is the very heaven of heaven. And I think that's a good quote. So is Christ so glorious? What will heaven be but the seeing the glory of Christ? So in John 17, if you go over to John 17, please. John chapter 17. Here in verse 24, uh, the Lord Jesus prays as our high priest, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me, that's us, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. That's like we shall see him as he is, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So uh, we will see Jesus' glory, see the glory of Christ. If God had created worlds of glorious creatures, I mean, you go to the zoo, you see amazing creatures. You, you know, kids love dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are amazing. Maybe in the millennium, we'll get to ride a dinosaur. I don't know. It'd be a lot of fun to ride another day if God brings them back. But whatever happens uh, with some of those things, the, you know, you go on a hike, it's beautiful, beautiful. But um, worlds of glorious creatures are nothing compared to the glory of the Son of God. And we're going to see his glory. And so um, we'll see the glory of Christ, who's the image of the invisible God. And so that will be crucial to the glory of heaven, seeing Christ and being like him. Um, we're going to look at Matthew 13, 43. Matthew 13, 43. It says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So that's some glory, shining forth as the sun. How many miles away is the sun from here? 93 million miles. That's a long way, okay? You ever float United flight that long, 93 million? No, maybe not. Okay, yeah, 93 million miles. And it's pretty bright out here, isn't it, from 93 million miles away? <laughs> It's not, it's not like a fluorescent light, like dink, okay? Very, very bright. So shining is the sun in the glory, the kingdom of their father. Wow. Romans 9 and verse 23. Look at Romans 9, 23. How sad for a Christian to not fully serve God and have less glory for all eternity because of some fading thing that he'll have for, you know, two years, three years that really has no value. What a sad, sad decision. Terrible decision. But Romans 9, 23. And I'll, I'll read 22 and 23. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So notice here, God talks about an exceeding weight of glory. Uh, the riches of his glory. Uh, so the riches of his glory, oh, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 is the exceeding eternal weight of glory. But here, God's prepared uh, the riches of his glory. And he's shown, just like on the vessels of wrath, in hell, God shows how what, all omnipotence, what omnipotence can do against you when you're wicked He's going to demonstrate that. He can make it so bad that it's like omnipotence. What full power of omnipotence can do against you? Really bad. But in heaven, he's going to show what an all-powerful God can do, exercising the, all of his power to make things as good as possible. So that's, an ex, that's a weight of glory. That's riches of glory. The, the all-powerful God loving you. You're his adopted child. You belong to him. Every, he's going to make it as good as he can make it for you. That is an exceeding and eternal, uh, that's riches of glory. That is rich glory on the vessels of mercy. And God has prepared you for glory, okay? You have difficulty in this life, well, God's prepared you for glory. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So uh, that is, uh, and I think meditating on that can help strengthen us to resist sin. And of course, this is what we want for people. This is why we want to be opening our mouth boldly 
and sharing the gospel with people and making it so that, you know, being able to do studies with this so they can come to glory too. We want, just like God is not willing that any should perish, we, we want people to have this everlasting glory, okay? This isn't just some game that we're playing. This is the truth. Everlasting glory here. All right, let's go we'll, uh, wrap that up. I wouldn't be surprised if next time we finish Bible study four, and that will be very exciting. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we're thankful for your work. Thank you for your infinitely great love. Thank you for freely justifying us by Christ. Thank you for sanctifying us, for uh, transforming our hearts so that we want you and your ways and changing us by your grace until we come to be with you in glory. I pray you'd help us to think about the heavenly glory that's coming, to live in light of it, that it would encourage us, that it would help us to set our affections on things above and not on things of the earth, and help it to make us bold in uh, proclaiming the gospel to other people so they can come to this everlasting, uh, glorious, uh, eternal home and see Jesus, uh, to whom uh, being with him is, is the most important thing in heaven itself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.